All right, welcome to my seminar. My name is Martin Urmikar. In the demo scene, I'm known as Preacher of Traction and brainstorm of several other groups. And I'm going to talk to you about today about uh, how to make a demo engine. Uh, this, is this will be a very general talk since uh, since I don't want to go into technical details. It's uh, it's a very let's say a topic which is kind of different from most other programming that I've done and I've done games and other kinds of software it's okay so okay so I think first we should talk about what actually is a demo it's not uh, it's not a very simple uh, topic there's m this is my defi definition program real-time demonstration that combines visuals and audio this I think many people would disagree with me on this. There would be flame wars and whatever on the internet, but this gives us an, uh, some kind of an idea what we actually should put in a demo. Okay, and uh, I uh, this is this is a list of things that actually we should expect in a demo. First of all, we of course we have effects, which is the first thing that comes into mind. Then we have interface to the operating system, which means opening the windows and interfacing to sound devices and all that stuff. Then we have uh, resources, which are all the things that your demo loads, for example, images, meshes, shader files, spline paths, vector data, whatever. We have the timeline, which means what happens and when. So for example, your effect starts now and this effect ends then and this post-processing happens th at this time. Then we have Synchronization, which means uh, some kinds of some kind of tools to actually combine the visuals with the music. Uh, in my opinion, com this is this is one of the most important things in a demo. Even if you have bad code, bad effects, bad music, and it's and its music still reacts to the visuals or the other way around, then the demo has capabilities of being good. Then we have utilities, which is. Uh, which are small things like, for example, mathematics classes, vectors, matrices, uh, file loading, data libraries, all kinds of that stuff. And then we have the param parameters and tweaking, which is uh, some way of making, uh, of tuning the visuals in real time. So basically, you don't have to uh, load, uh, oh the, you, you don't have to recompile the demo every time you want to change something. This part is kind of optional, but I've included it because I implemented it in my new engine, and it's actually quite necessary to sa sa save your nerves and to try to speed up the process of making the demo. Okay. Okay. So then there's the question of which platform are you actually going to make your demo in? This is uh, if you're do if you're doing demo in Windows, w as most people are, th you have options of doing it in DirectX or OpenGL. If you're using a Mac or a Linux, you're probably going to use it in op uh, OpenGL, or then you, have to then you have to write in software rendering. Then there are the old school platforms, C64, Amiga, MSX, Spectrum ZX, all those things. Uh, demo programming on them is very different from programming on modern machines, and I'm not gonna going to cover it in this seminar at all. There are people who are more qualified than I am. And then there's finally software rendering, which means that you are not using your 3D cardio, but you are actually actually uh, writing your own triangle fillers and all that stuff. It's no, it's not very common nowadays, but it's very ed educational if you want to do it. It's all, but it's also kind of pointless. But it has it has its own own fun if you want to put it that way. Okay, and uh, before we s actually start talking about the demo engine itself, uh, I would like to note that there are actually two ways, two basic ways to make a demo. And the, uh, there's the artist way and the programmer way. Some people call them the smart way and the stupid way, but this is, uh, this is the way I put it. The artist way means that you, instead of actually coding the effects and uh, doing the demo timelining or whatever in the code, but you actually, you make a tool like a, sm let's say, uh, some something like 3ds Max, for example, where you can compose and t build a timeline and build the effects, and then you, then anyone can use the tool without programming it. There are uh, numerous groups that do this, like for example, Farbrush, Fairlight, and Conspiracy, which are all known for their tools. Uh, uh, the Farbrush tool call, called Workzeug, it's available on the net. You should try it if you want. And then there's the programmer's way, which means that which is a traditional way, and it means that you actually code everything yourself. 
and that's the what that's what I'm going to talk about today. It's also for a beginner. It's much much simpler and. Uh, engine that's made out of the pro programmer's way can easily be converted into a tool if it's done properly. Okay, and now f uh, there are some basic goals that you should you should follow. Like for example, be smart, know what you're programming in. Uh, I'm I'm personally using C++, and with C++ there's something called STL, which is Standard Templates Library, which offers a lot of useful tools and small helper methods and that sort of stuff. You should really Learn it. There's one in Java as well and C sharp. I don't know about other languages. Then the second main point is to be sensible. So do you don't you should if you get by with simple stuff, you should not make stuff complex. That's bad. Because complex code is difficult to maintain and difficult to write. And then the first thing uh, the last thing, be lazy. That's actually a good thing because if you are actually lazy, that means that you write things properly for the first time. So you don't actually have to rewrite things. And uh, also, there's, uh, the right systems, not bits of code, which means that, for example, if you write some uh, function that, for example, loads an image, you should, uh, at the same time, you should write a uh, system that actually also uses the, uh, your load image function, so that you should not uh, use it in many places, but, but only at one place, so that so that uh, it's there's a single point of failure if you do so. Or if, or if if something breaks, okay, and this is a topic uh, which is kind of optional. Uh, my engine is uh, done so that I have two two main classes where things are. I have a systems class which is uh, which contains let's say uh, all the interfaces to the operating system. It contains uh, textures and that sort of stuff. And I have a demo class which uh, contains the timeline and the actual effects. And the reason why I did this is that uh, I can easily take the system class and uh, then just rewrite the demo class, so I, uh, I can reuse the code very easily. This is not uh, mandatory, but it's a good thing to keep in mind. So, now uh, before we actually get to the fun parts of actually coding the demo system, or the demo, we need to talk about the boring stuff, which is uh, interfacing to your operating system. And this means that, for example, there are things like Opening, uh, opening your window, getting your timers, uh, to uh, playing music and that sort of stuff. That's actually very much not fun to write, but it's necessary. But luckily, there are people who have done it for you. If you are using OpenGL, you, you can use the library called SDL for Simple Direct Media Library. It's available on basically all platforms that can run OpenGL. It does all that boring stuff for you. So basically. Uh, open GL message mes uh, basic loop with SDL is like 10 lines of code maybe and there are lots of tutorials for it so you should check it out if you're using uh, DirectX uh, the DirectX developer kit offers uh, lots of examples you so basically you should just uh, strip the pa code f uh, steal the code from there and be happy with it and uh, for audio libraries there are two that are widely used there's uh, fmod or fsound and bass Either is good. They are free for non-commercial use, such as demos. And uh, for image libraries, DirectX contains very good facilities for loading stuff, so you shouldn't worry about that. And for OpenGL, there are uh, libp lib JPEG and libpng that are used. That's good. And there's something called OpenIL or Devil, which I use, which is basically those two combined into one plus some other features, which it's really simple to use. And also, SDL can itself load files, so you shouldn't worry about that. As, as always, if someone has all, if, so, if someone has written stuff that you can use, you should use the other people's stuff instead of writing your own. That's uh, the primary part of being the being lazy part. Okay, so this is something that most demo engines of the programmer type have. These just small bits of code, not n not necessarily. Uh, Linked to anything else, small things like vectors and matrices for mathematics, maybe spline routines or some primitive drawing. Like for example, I have uh, one line, a uh, one function that calls uh, draw cube, so I can draw cubes with only one line of code. It's u useful testing, and it's also in my part is unfortunately I tend to first test with a draw cube and then leave the cubes in the demo. So that's actually the reason why I have so many cubes in my demos. 
And then uh, a font system is nice to have. It's not necessary. Uh, most people do fonts with uh, uh, like just text. So the graphician or someone makes the text, and then you just draw, uh, draw an, an Im image. That's fine. But a font system can offer some benefits. Like for example, you can write numbers in the screen or whatever. Okay. So those are the those are the boring parts. And now for the fun part, the resources. Now. Uh, I would like to introdu introduce you to something called the manager pattern, which is a uh, very fancy computer science way of uh, putting that you should all have everything in one place. So you should have one kind of one manager object which uh, loads all the images and you access all your images, for example, or shaders or meshes or whatever, through that one single object. Uh, if you if you, uh, let's say, spread your resource handling in many places, you will get strange bugs and strange, well, not maybe strange bugs, but it will be difficult to maintain. And if there's something wrong, like, for example, a texture doesn't show up or something, it's much better to have all the code related to textures in one place only. And it will also, it will also make your effect code much, 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 much more simpler. And uh, in uh, STL, at least, there's a data structure called map which is basically an, an associative array so you give it the, so you give it let's say a string and it maps you to a texture or the other way around it's very good for for implementing this so basically the kind of mani texture manager thing could be i think it's like maybe 50 lines of code in my system and it's and it works works really well and also uh, one thing really good with the manager pattern is that uh, you can actually use it for debugging for example, you can make it out, print all the all the textures you, you, for example, load in your code, and this, and for example, calculate how much display memory they take. It's very simple doing this, or you can, uh, for example, if, if relating to textures, you can, for example, uh, check which uh, textures that you actually loaded are used, and you can just not load the others. And the way my engine loads uh, all the resources is that. I have all the different types of resources in uh, separate directories, for example, one for graphics, one for shaders, one for meshes, and it loops through all the, the engine loops through all the uh, directories and all the files in, the, in them, and it loads them all, and they all are all in their own managers. So I have a texture manager, I have a mesh manager, I have a shader manager, and they are uh, automatically loaded at the start of the demo. So it's very simple, once you implement it, it's very simple to to use and also it's really simple to reuse so you can just throw away your re old resources and put in new ones and you can start making your next demo so if there's actually one thing that you should remember from this seminar it, uh, relating to demo engine making it's this use, use, the, use the manager pattern basically all the demo engine in the end all, all everything it is it's a manager or bunch of managers okay and then there's the timeline like uh, this is basically what happens when, like for example, now we show the plasma, now we show the tunnel, and so forth. Uh, some people have written like huge main loops which had which have five thousand lines and like two thousand if sentences. I have seen one. I have actually seen several. I'm, I've written one, and the one that I wrote taught me that it, that's not the way to do it. So how I've done it now is that I have one base class, uh, which from which I inherit all the uh, all the effects. And I have a list uh, of the objects of the base class, which actually point to the uh, actual effects. And all the effects uh, of the base class has uh, methods like initialize, draw, update, release, that sort of stuff. And the engine actually handles it really neatly. So I only have one loop uh, which uh, says update all the effects. I have one loop that says draw all effects that are active. And uh, what I mean by active e effects is that uh, each uh, object of the base class contains a start time, so basically when it's when it's when you start drawing it, and the end time, which is when you start uh, when you stop drawing it, and a priority, which says uh, in which order do you draw them. So it basically, if you have two two or more running at the same time, it, the priority allows you to to swap them in s in such a way that you can you can. Uh, decide how on, on which order you draw them and this is uh, I think my system is like 500 lines of code for all of this 
uh, it's very stable, it's very easy, and uh, it's the way I, I think most people do it. I don't know about that many demo engines or have, have seen the source, but still. Okay. And then we have the synchronization, and this is again the important bit. This, this is how you make your demo cool. And there are different ways to synchronize. Uh, th these are the terms that I use. Uh, my engine has triggers, which are, uh, which are uh, uh, times. So basically, let's say I put the trigger at uh, 50, uh, 50 seconds that will last for one second. And uh, in the effect, I can ask the engine that which uh, triggers are active and uh, uh, w which kind of position they are in. So my in my engine, uh, at the point you hit the trigger, it, uh, it gives you the value of one and it interpolates down to zero at the end of the trigger. trigger. And you can use this, for example, uh, beat syncing or object movement or if you want to move something to the beat. It's really easy to do with triggers. And then I have events, which are basically the tr uh, kind of triggers, but uh, as in triggers you can have many, many uh, values. In e events you only have one. So basically in my engine ev an event is something that is also, it's only, uh, it basically it's a one trigger only, but I use events to make it distinct from the triggers. Then there's beat calculation, that I in music, your musician can give you uh, beats per minute, like how fast the song is going, and you can actually use the beats per minute uh, to calculate, let's say you have a bass drum that hits every fourth measure, like tum, 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 so you can actually calculate easily when those tums are, and you can actually react to them, you so you don't have to write uh, 1,500 1, triggers for a long demo, so you can just calculate it. It's very useful, if especially if you want to do the 90s demos with lots of flashing lights and that's good for that. And then there's uh, f this FFT slash audio data, which means that the if you have a good music system, such as bass or FMOD, uh, you can get the frequencies of the song that is playing. And for example, you can analyze that there's this much bass and this much uh, treble and this much middle and uh, just like a, you know, a good stereo system, and that's very useful for syncing. So you can, for example, calculate the energy of the uh, of the signal. So, for example, sum those all those numbers together. So you can basically get some kind of idea on how the how loud the song is actually playing. And you can sync, for example, glow or uh, object speech or something like that. Or you can uh, or you can make different parts of the demo react to different frequencies. That's something that's often done. And uh, in my engine, I'm, usi I'm using the time in seconds. So I'm using the real time uh, method. And some people like to also sync to the beat in the way that they don't calculate seconds, but they calculate measures and uh, fourth fourths of a measure from the, uh, from the music. So for example, you can say that uh, the music goes by bars, so if you, let's say, you play first this effect for 10 bars and then this effect for uh, 8 bars or whatever, however the music goes. Uh, those people who who do this say it's a much better method. I haven't personally tried it. I will try it though, so uh, I will, if, I give in, if I'm giving this seminar next year, I will tell you how, to, how it's worked out. And then there's this uh, final part called parameters and tweaking. Now this is this is really not essential. Many people do their demos entirely without this. Uh, I personally I implemented a system where I have a long text file which I can fill with stuff. I can write let's say int int object count equals 50, and then I can in the engine I can ask that I can ask that give me the object count, and it actually reads it from the file. And that's a very good way, so you can uh, you can actually edit what you are seeing, you can edit in real time, which makes the development a mod much, much faster. And I used to, let's not, I, let's, not, let's not use the word lab, but I used to kind of think that this is, isn't necessary, but when I finally implemented it, I found, I discovered that I was playing, playing with my demo engine, it was two in the morning, and I, I, I was tweaking one effect, so it's really something that's good to keep in mind. 
the m my how my system works is that I have a, a, a number of control buttons in my demo. I have play, which basically starts the demo. I have pause, which pauses the demo, and uh, rewind and f fast forward keys, so I can go back and forth in the demo timeline, and the demo reacts on the screen. Uh, then I have reload, which means that which means that uh, it reloads all the parameters in the uh, in the file, so it it up updates in real time. So I can, for example, I can pause the demo, then uh, change the value, reload, see how it looks, pause the demo again. Uh, re uh, rewind it so I can see the same part again. This is very useful for syncing, so you can actually you can adjust values in real time. And then I have the reinit, which actually reinitializes all the effects. So uh, it's kind of a stronger version of the r of the reload, but you can actually let's say you allocate 50 objects in the in the beginning of the demo. And and then you change some values, and you want to uh, allocate those 50 objects again. You can use the reinit thing, which basically loads the demo again. It's not as fast as doing reloading, but it's still good. And I am I am going to also add uh, texture reloading when I'm when I'm uh, going to continue working on the on the engine. It's really good. And now, if you think of this as the as the uh if you if you if you think of this as the programmer's way of doing things so now that you actually have all the res all the resources all the whatever you have in your demo and you have uh, controls for it then it's actually actually quite close to the artist way of doing things so you should you pay perhaps you could act add for example a user interface some kind of uh lots of people do it and then you would actually have almost like a demo tool kind of demo system I'm not going to do that, but a couple of my friends have. And then there are the effects. Now this is something that really can't be taught. It's graphi graphics programming in general. So for example, you can pick up any single book on computer graphics and you can uh, and you can look into it as an insight on how to make demo effects. A good way of good way of starting doing this is just to copy what other people do. Most demo effects are in fact very very simple. You should not be afraid of them. There's a some kind of legend or a myth that doing demo effect is hard. It's actually not. I think most stuff you see in demos could be fit in like 100 li 100 lines of code. So it's very usually very simple. And the, the difficult part is to make them look good, but that's well that's the fun part. And uh, there are lots of source codes to demos available. You can come and ask me. I will give source codes to all of what all of the stuff that I've ever done. There's also some repositories like on puet.net. If you visited it, you should visit it and with a and wear your flame hat. But uh, it has lots of links to source codes with of demos. And uh, finally, about effects. Learn graphics programming properly or improperly, it doesn't matter as long as you make demos. That's the fun part because lots of uh, much of the demo code is uh, it's actually horrible. So you should not be ashamed or worried that on what you write as, as long as you write it. And uh, as navies of Andromeda Software Development put it, uh, sine and cosine can build cathedrals. And what he meant what what he meant by this is that none of the math all well almost none of the mathematics in demos is actually difficult at, at all like normal normal high school mathematics is more than enough to actually make demos and the fun part actually become is that how you how you combine the mathematics into something really 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 cool and that's the beauty of demo making i think Okay, so I reserve some time for questions. You can ask them now, or you can come to talk to me per in person. I'm usually pretty friendly, or you can come to uh, Scene Booth channel on, I on IRCNet. I will be there answering questions, or you can e send me an email. I will answer, hopefully. And there are a couple. There are two links that I put there. Uh, one is in 4K, which is uh, a site dedicated 4K intros. 
much of what I said here does not apply to small intros because small intros need special considerations and you can't, for example, write a texture manager in a 4K. It's just not possible to use, this, use the limited space you have for this. And then there's uh, front, uh, front end, which is a ready-made demo engine. It's much more advanced than my engine is. It's uh, very simple to use. I, tr I tried it. So, uh, it includes all kinds of features like uh, networking and graphics loading and mesh loading and scenes and uh, it, well, a lot of very good demos have been have been made with it. So it's worth ch checking it out. And also, uh, the front end si front end site has uh, lots of information on how to set, set up compilers and how to actually sta uh, start doing uh, demos on Windows, which is good because the compiler environments are pretty difficult to set up if you're a beginner. Okay, so uh, questions, anyone? Okay, yes? I started by thinking that I want to make cool stuff. So that's how most people start, started. Nowadays, I would re I would re recommend uh, making uh, making a simple demo or a 4K intro first. So 4K intro is a very small project to actually do, so you can't fit much code in there. So, but you can still still get the feel on how to do things. And uh, writing a small demo is a little bit more work because uh, unfortunately you need to do more more base code and more boring stuff before you actually can get to doing things. But uh, everything I said to today here, it's not, it's not a law. So just as long as you make something, you make something. And y y it can, the, your code can be crap, my code often is, but it doesn't, it, that doesn't matter as long as you do stuff. And then when, you, when you've learned, then you will do it better. Okay, yes? Well, there have been some tries, I think, but no, networking demos is not popular, unfortunately. But the uh, front-end engine, it can be also used for games and for all kinds of multimedia applications, so, so uh, it's so it's, I think the functionality is meant for them. But of course, you can be the first pe person to actually make a really great networking demo. So, so you can try it. Yes. Well, multiple viewpoint interaction. One of my favorite ideas is to make a demo that's dynamic so it's different every time and when you actually run it it connects to the some server somewhere and no two people ever get the same demo because it for example downloads some kind of random seed from there or you could make a demo that evolves that uh, uh, every time uh, every time the demo ends you can it asks the user did you like this demo and if, if the user says yes then it sends the demo parameters to the server and the server actually evolves the demo or something those are the two ideas i've been playing around or thinking about but of course i'm lazy so i'm not i haven't done anything okay okay anything else yes well you are the flash guru here so if you want to sp specify the question, I mean, Yeah. 
So he he suggested that uh, Flash as a demo platform, if you want to do software render stuff, because it provides most of the stuff that I've been talking here. I don't know I don't know enough about Flash so that I could say I could recommend it. But if he says it's good, then it's good. Okay. Anyone else? So the question was that. Uh, yeah. So the question was that if good demos can be done in Flash because they are interpreted languages and not compiled, uh, there have been plenty of demos done, for example, in JavaScript, and plenty of demos done in Flash. And most of what I've seen are good. So the answer is yes. Of course, it's slower, but we have f four gigahertz machines nowadays, so I don't think it's a big issue. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the question was which part of mathematics are useful for demo coding? Uh, Personally, I think that linear algebra, which is matrices and vectors, is that's vital. That's something you unfortunately cannot miss. But that's for the most part that's really simple. It's it all it ends up being uh, is multiplication, and then then there's uh, trigonometry, which is uh, really also vital to demo coding. But that's basically it. Uh, there have been, of course, some demos which. Imp include all kinds of other mathematics like for example uh, one of the more popular effects nowadays is uh, fluid dynamics simulations uh, to be honest i'm quite sure that most people who actually write the code don't understand what it what they are doing they just copied it from somewhere but because it's actually kind of hard but uh, yes you should you should learn uh, trigonometry and linear alg linear algebra and that's enough to make almost any kind of demo because the demos are about style and the art and the content and not in my opinion not that much about the actual technical details some people of, of course will disagree but okay any more questions anyone else So basically, the question was that if I'm happy to put my source code up, up, up for people to grabs, and if I'm happy with it, well, the answer is that I am going to, uh, from now on, I'm going to release all of my new source code. It's going to be open source, totally. And as for the old ones, I will give it away. And when I have made it look not that awful, then I will release it also. So no, I am not quite happy with all the things that I've ever written. But I don't think anyone is. But if you want it, you can uh, you ask for it, you get it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the question was that which license I am going to put my stuff in. Well, I was I'm personally thinking of some form of Creative Commons. Uh, I would not object to GPL except that I think that people will be put off by looking at or using GPL code and personally I don't I th I think that what I'm going to try to do for the scene is uh, my contribution if and if it should not require other people 
to uh, give out their stuff. That's your personal choice. So I will go either for create some form of Creative Commons, and then I will go a BSD license, which does not require uh, publication of source code. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Well, the question is that if I have any good examples on how not to make a demo. I have several, most of which are kind of painful. I think the worst thing you can actually do is to try to do too much for the first time. So you're trying to do too more than you can actually swallow. And that's actually a very common beginner mistake. So you, my, op my suggestion is that you start with really simple stuff and then work your way up. And uh, other... other uh, bad thing to do is to uh, is to pick the wrong tools that's really bad so for example if you want to write a demo do not you should not write your first demo in assembly language I know a person who did and he cursed himself afterwards but uh, yeah you should not you should not make more uh, something more complex than you can make you, you know you know your limits and also, uh, don't be ashamed of what you do. If the first thing you ever make is it's crap, it you most probably is, mine was horrible, then you should just release it anyway and m make sure that the next one is better. So don't, don't give up. And don't forget to ask for help if you need help. Okay, anyone else? Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you for your time. Come to talk to me if you have any more questions or just want to talk about demos or something else. And if you have any sort of demo programming questions, send me an email, come, uh, come to talk to me on IRC, whatever. Okay, thank you. <laughs>